Wherefore, brethren, become not unwise, but understanding what is the will of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful, those words come from the epistle. That it's, we must, in order to be wise, we must understand the will of God. It's an axiom, in fact, of the spiritual life, that God only rewards his own work. God only rewards his own work. In other words, he only rewards works that are done as he wants them to be done. He blesses his own plan. He blesses his own work. Scripture shows this. Experience shows this. And yet few act, in fact, as if it were true. The truth is that our nature, our fallen human nature, rebels against God. It rebels against giving God exactly what he wants. We may give God a lot of what he wants, or something of what he wants. But our fallen human nature rebels against giving God exactly what he wants. Often, we're willing, we're even anxious to give God what, from our point of view, is even better than his will. It's even more difficult, an offering. We're often willing to make great efforts to give what we want to give. But to give exactly what God wants us to give, that's a hard thing. We can be so blind. We often can give, even doing and undertaking difficult tasks, we can give in such a way that the real surrender of our will is not given. We make lots of efforts our way, but the self-surrender perhaps is not there. And let's face it, for God, this real surrender of our will For God, this real surrender is not just seasoning on top. It's the main. It's what he's looking for. The surrender, the obedience. We could call it, when we fail, we could call it disobedience. Or we could call it the act of an ungenerous soul. Or we could call it mad short-sightedness. But it comes down to the same thing. It's a subtle contest of wills. God's will or my will. And this contest of wills, you think, oh, that's just for those who who don't try to follow God at all. There is not a contest. It's already a foregone conclusion. It's not even a battle. This contest of wills, This struggle of wills, God's or ours, it rages most viciously, most fiercely in those precisely who are used to giving, who are used to being generous, who have learned that sanctity is nothing other than generosity, consistent and relentless. And the nearer, therefore, a soul draws to God, the more the soul is tempted to deceive himself into giving something of his own choosing. I've given so much already. God surely must be pleased. I'll give him something as I want to give it. Something of my own creation. A recipe of my own. When God has already made it clear what he wants. The nearer, and these are the words of A lot of these ideas, in fact, are taken from Father Hubert von Zeller in a book that he wrote called Prophets and Princes. If I'm not giving direct quotation marks all the time, it's just so I don't bore you. But a lot of the thoughts are his. The nearer such souls draw to God, the more they are are tempted to deceive themselves into giving a natural thing. When a supernatural thing thing is asked of them. God doesn't just want our natural plan. 
He wants his plan, the supernatural, fulfilled. Let's take an example from the Old Testament. The Old Testament example of Saul, the first king of Israel. You can find this in the first book of Kings, chapter 15. Basically what happened was this. God gave Saul an order to utterly destroy the wicked nation of Amalek. God is the master of life and death. God gave this this very severe sentence. And it is a severe sentence. Destroy everything and everyone of this nation. The sentence was severe. But that's not Saul's affair. Nor is it ours. The sentence was perfectly clear. Do not spare anything. Do not spare anyone. And what did Saul do? He spared the king of that nation. He spared King Agog, whom he took as a prisoner and put on parade as a show of his power. And Saul spared the best of the flocks of that nation and the most beautiful of the garments and the spoils. But he destroyed all the rest. He spared the best, but he destroyed the more or less tattered things. Those things that were not so dear. And God was not pleased. He did conquer the nation. He did fulfill most of the order. But God was not pleased. And he sent the old prophet, Samuel, who had been the very prophet that anointed Saul as king and made him king, He sent old Samuel back to Saul. Samuel arrived at the very moment when Saul was offering sacrifice of these best spoils, offering sacrifice to God. And Saul, surely a little feeling a little guilty inside when he saw Samuel. Well, he greeted him and tried to cover over what he had done. He said, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have fulfilled the word of the Lord. I have done what God has asked me to do. And Samuel simply answers, Then what's that sound of bleeding that I hear? The bleeding and the lowing of flocks. What's that? And Saul blames the others. Saul says, Oh, they, the, my men, They brought them from Amalek, for they spared the best of the flocks that they might be sacrificed to the Lord thy God. But we have slain all the rest. You notice how he's trying to justify an obedience to God's will. How typical it is. And this isn't just Saul. If we talk about this, it's because we do something similar, at least we're tempted to. How typical. He disobeys the word of the Lord. Then he makes a public display of having fulfilled it. And when he's called out on that, he blames it on someone else. And then finally puts it all up to what's well, done for the glory of God. Look at how fallen human nature acts. Poor Samuel, this prophet. He has to remind Saul of all the things that God has done for him. Don't you trust him? He made you king. He did this. He did this. All these good things that happened in your life that happened because God, it was the will of God for you. Having you learned to trust that his will is what matters. After reminding God, after reminding Saul all that God had done for him, he concludes, why then have you not hearkened to the voice of the Lord? Why have you done evil? And then Saul still, he He feigns not to understand. God's order was clear, that's true, but I don't understand why God has a problem with this. I I more or less fulfilled his orders. And what I didn't do exactly, I didn't do exactly because I was trying to do something better for the glory of God. I was going to offer him a sacrifice. 
how similar this is to us. Even when we see God's will clearly, which we don't always take the time even to look for it, but even when we see God's will clearly, we seldom comply with it in any way but our own. And somehow conscious that we've held something back, we seek to balance things out by offering other goods of our own invention, goods that God didn't ask. We spare ourselves on a certain effort that God has asked, and then feeling guilty, we f- we often multiply activities somewhere else to try to compensate. Yeah, we, we're not going to be able to pull, over, pull a fast one on God. He's not going to miss the sleight of hand. God wants what he asks. What does Samuel do? Samuel said, Doth the Lord desire holocausts and victims? You're, you're saying you do this for the glory of God. You're, you're offering this sacrifice. Does the Lord desire holocausts and victims? And not rather that the voice of the Lord be obeyed. For obedience is better than sacrifice. And to listen is better than to offer the fat of rams. God wants obedience. Well, Saul, King Saul, he had all but obeyed God's orders. And now he all but repents. He kind of repents. He does finally say, I'm sorry. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I repent for having feared the people and for having obeyed their voice. He still makes it someone else's problem. But he kind of repents. It's too bad he didn't repent from the heart. Or that he didn't repent entirely. Because in the end, we all know the king's soul went completely off track. Having done his own will, instead of God's, so many times, he no longer had the grace. And he went completely off track. And the kingship was given to David. He hadn't, it's not as if he hadn't been warned. What about us then? What about us? Each of us, I think, has to reflect and see where in our own lives we try to play games with God. God's will matters. His Ten Commandments, the precepts of the church, those are good places to start. But our duty of state as well, in the home, or at uni, or wherever it is, where do we try to give God something different or less than he's asked for. Perhaps for some it could be, well, I know I'm addicted to the internet. I spend so much time on it, but well, I do watch some pious things. I'll just watch more pious things. I know I can't get away from the internet. I'll just watch more pious things from now on. If God wants you somewhere else, God wants you somewhere else. All right, the it's not the the point, but all right, there is a good there is a good uh, booklet now available in the in the parish hall on digital safety. It's not it's more about it's more than just you know safeguard your children from terrible images. That's there true too, but this weakens our will in a massive way and makes us blind to God's will in many ways. Others, perhaps, it's, I know I lack self-control. I know I lack temperance. So I'll just make sure that I, I put a religious spin on my intemperance. I'll over-drink and over-eat on big feast days. Out of the glory, for the glory of God. And, well, you know, we should really love the liturgical year. So I celebrate for every feast day. Every saint, especially Saint Ferial. We can find a way. Or, I know I'm not a very good parent. I know I don't have a great connection with my children or my spouse. So, I'll spend hours making up for it by going out and serving the poor. Or hours spent in the church. It's a good thing to spend time in the church. 
but all along neglecting even more the duty that I have to my family. Not that church and family are meant to be in conflict, but we will often run to pious things rather than do our duty. At least we'll be tempted. Or I know vulgar language is wrong. I know it's displeasing to God. But it's the only way for me to be taken seriously in my workplace. Is that going to work with God? Or I know that if I, that I shouldn't lose my temper. But it's the only way my kids will listen to me. Or I know I shouldn't lose my temper. But it's the only way my parents will listen to me. Or I know I shouldn't dress or behave. I, sh- I know that I should dress and behave as a Catholic. But if I do that, then I'll never find the spouse. And how am, I, how am I going to raise a good Catholic family if I don't find a spouse? How we can deceive ourselves. And it goes on and on. God doesn't want you to steal and then make up for it by giving the money to the church. He wants you not to steal. And of course, when I preach this sermon, I'm preaching to myself too. We all tend to try to find some way to escape God's will for us. And we do it under the guise of piety. We must not think that God is, that we're going to slip one over on God. It's not possible. God means what he says. God wants us to fulfill what he asks. He's a merciful God. And he's not looking to catch us up in every little, you know, let's say, ignorance or misstep, accidental misstep. That's not God. But he does want us to strive to give him what he's asked. And exactly what he's asked of us. God will only bless his own work. These days, of course, and it's not just because I'm American, but I hear it from you too. These days, of course, many minds are and, and time is spent following the elections, upcoming elections in the United States. And certainly it is a subject for prayer. But we have to be clear. Politicians, politicians that think that they will be able to serve God better by compromising on essential issues are making a big mistake. I'm not predicting what God's going to do. I'm not saying that, you know, that, that one might not vote, vote for the, the lesser of two evils. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying politicians who have logic such as, well, I'll serve God once I'm elected into office, but first I need to be elected. And condemning abortion, for example, is not very popular. So I just won't talk about it, or I'll sidestep it, or I'll water down position on it. That's not going to win God's blessing. It's not the way to serve God. It's human prudence, perhaps. It's not supernatural wisdom. So whatever the results, and God can be very merciful for the sake of others, perhaps. But whatever the results, that kind of logic must find no place in our hearts. And when we see it in others, we must pray for their conversion. Let us take a few lessons then, as tomorrow is the Feast of the Holy Rosary, Let us take a few lessons from the mysteries of the Holy Rosary. All throughout the Rosary, if you look at it, it's God's will that matters. It's God's will that's sought. And when it's recognized, it's God's will that is immediately and precisely obeyed with a generous fiat, unconditional fiat. Be it done unto me according to thy word. I would recommend then if you can, during the, the Mass, to reread your introit of today's Mass and to reread the epistle of today's Mass, that we might be truly wise, seeking 
and fulfilling always and everywhere the will of our God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.